secrets when you breathe it in. So don't let the corporate media take you for a spin. It's that morning show. They put you in the know. So I hope that you're ready. All we do is go, go, go. Yeah, come get your info. You gon' be like, whoa. Here with the dog. We bout that, eh? Bringing the song. We out here, yeah. Spinning the fact. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to... Well, I guess you could call it Wet Wednesday in, you know, conjunction with Wet Monday because my rain has now turned to snow. And I'm sure, Carrie, your snow has now turned to rain. Uh, actually, no, we have clear skies today. So it should be up in the 60s today, sunny. It's beautiful. Sorry, Andy, you're on your own. I'm not yeah. playing anymore. <laughs> oh, no, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. It's just, um, it, it'll be a lovely join me. <laughs> um, oh, yes, yes, sure. I'm, I'm sure if I drove really fast, they'd, they'd just open the border for me so I could drive across. Well, I yeah, uh, that's true. Like, Americans can't go north, but I think Canadians can still come south so long as you've got all your Trump 2020 gear uh, ready to go. They should just wave you right through. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> right. So this morning we wanted to talk about an issue that is, is bubbled up in California. And for those people who are looking at this saying, well, I don't live in California. This doesn't matter. I'm like, oh yes, it does. Because what is happening in California is happening in other parts of the country and may have already taken over a city near you and you just don't realize it. So we want to talk about this today. We were hoping to get a guest on from the Teamsters from local 1932. They may be sleeping in this morning, so we'll, we'll keep an eye out and see if they're able to connect with us. But the reason we wanted to have them on is um, they seem to be at the forefront of this fight against Prop 22 as a union organization. So who better to have on for this particular um, this particular show than than that group? But despite that, there's so much to talk about, especially in light of the late night confirmation of now Supreme Court Justice Amy Barrett. People are losing their shit over this and talking about we're going to lose all our rights. Uh, well, Andy, you and I have been talking about this for weeks, that if you don't want to leave it to the interpretation of a justice, even at the Supreme Court, change the law, write better laws. I mean, it seems pretty simple, don't you think? Well, yeah, of course. And it's a way to distract, right? Like, I mean, if we know that the Democrats are, you know, trying to scare the hell out of people to voting for them although you know you know our opinion on democrats you know our, our f favorite party um that this is this can be used as a scare tactic right just like their entire russia 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 narrative and orange man bad and now you know conservative judges bad, right? You just pile up on you that say that, well, you don't have a choice. Right? Well, yeah, every election is so dire and life-threatening and everything else. And you've got to have, these are the new wedge issues, right? So we've got a repeat of women's reproductive rights under Roe versus Wade being of threat, um, LGBT marriage equality, and a bunch of civil rights uh, particularly in the Voting Rights Act that has been gutted largely um, over the last four or five years. So all of these things, while important, the obvious solution seems to elude corporate media and the narrative, and it's really not helping people to educate themselves and how basic civics works. So here we have ex an example of Prop 22, where the corporations are themselves taking this example and trying to change the law because they got a ruling from a judge recently that they didn't like. So rather than go through the courts, they're going to change the law. And they're spending millions to convince voters in California that this is the right way to go. So let's talk about that. 
what their argument is, what they're actually doing, and what it means for not only the people of California, but everyone across this country, right? So the reason why this particular program is about workers' rights is because the fundamental nature of this argument, one side, the corporations are trying to make an, an employee a temporary worker, a contractor, and the employees themselves in the state of California are trying to protect workers in the free market, creating that free market, trying to have that monopoly protection is saying, no, you can't do that to employees. So this particular argument also crosses over into the excuse that people give for not wanting something like Medicare for all. Well, you can get your insurance through your employer. Well, here are millions of drivers for Uber and Lyft who are being told that you are not an employee, you do not get workers' rights, you do not get the protections of an employee in a corporation in that type of contract. You are an independent contractor, you're on your own, no benefits, no protections, nothing. So that is what this particular argument is about and why it's so important. So Andy, let's start with you. You worked for a major corporation as a union member. How awful was that? Well, <laughs> it was, it, it's, a, it's kind of a tale of two stories, right? Because when I, I started um, in 1987 and I became a, a, uh, a member of the, uh, at the time, which was the CAW, which is the Canadian version of the UAW, which is the United Auto Workers, right? And uh, back in the 80s, you know, it, the union was still very strong. It was, you know, uh, looking out for workers, uh, the move towards uh, the defanging of unions had really, for the most part, started yet, right? So. The wages were good. The benefits were very good. And, and you know, we've seen since then the uh, erosion of, of workers' rights and with the rise of, in, especially in the U.S., right-to-work uh, states and all of this stuff that's happening. So working for an, a large corporation just on its own was, was absolutely horrid, right? Because you see from within the decision-making process and the us versus them mentality that at the time there were uh, Japanese corporations that were doing um, a more friendly work environment where the, the management and the workers were more integrally uh, working together for the betterment of the, of the people in the plant and to make a, a better working environment. And it just seemed to be the complete opposite um, that it was moving away from that in, in the, the automotive plant that I worked in, right? And so it, uh, when I started at General Motors in Oshawa, Ontario, there was about 25,000 uh, blue collared employees, so workers, unionized workers in that. When I retired in 2017, there were just over 1,300. And since then, the plant has basically shut down. That's incredible. That's, uh, that's uh, you know, and I remember working um, early on in my career for a massive multinational corporation that was headquartered in Ohio and then moved to Atlanta. And when I started, there were 156,000 employees. By the time I left, it was down to about um, just over 100,000 employees. So it doesn't sound like that much of a shift, but that's a massive, massive departure of employees. And we only had union membership from some of the uh, tech workers, a very small portion of the repair tech workers, everyone else was so encouraged to not unionize that it would hurt us, that uh, we would lose benefits. Meanwhile, um, when I started, you had a pension fund that ended for new employees. And I remember the older workers going, well, you'll survive, you're young enough, don't worry about it. And we would say to them, well, we, um, 
we we recognize that we may be able to work longer and that sort of thing. But what about you? They're coming for you next. And that's exactly what happened. Within just a few years, you had the company make the announcement for the older workers that the pension was ending and they lost their shit. And we were like, see, when you divide us, when you're not with us, when you're not fighting for us, what can we do for you now? Because they were losing their pensions too. So this was a, a, a big company, just as big as the one you work for, without union representation. And it was every man for themselves. And, you know, I, as a little person, I can't fight the big company. I still had to pay a mortgage. I had a kid to raise. What was I supposed to do? But this is kind of where the power of we comes in. And this is part of what we're seeing in this fight in California. So um, we just had our, jet, our our very special guest join us this morning. So I want to make sure to get him introduced and we'll do our sound check on the fly. Randy, good morning. How are you? Uh, good morning. How are you? I'm good. You got no video. What's going on? We want to see the oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on calls already this morning. And, oh, and, uh, okay. You know, I haven't had a chance to, uh, uh, I guess, get cleaned up, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what? We're still having our coffee. I have COVID hair. I I've managed to get one haircut all year, and you can see I now look like a pioneer. Um, so yeah, just turn your camera on. We're all friendly here. There you go. All right. You're fine. Oh, there you, go. Nice. you look better than us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's in California, so I think that's kind of part and parcel to it. So. Oh no, no I mean, I, I get you know. Obviously, we have our headquarters in Washington D.C., so my stuff starts pretty early sometimes. Oh, so. oh nice. <laughs> yeah, but. So, um, tell everybody, tell our audience who you are, who you represent, and why the hell they should care about the work that you're doing. Uh, my name is Randy Corgan. I'm the secretary treasurer of Teamsters Local 1932 in Southern California, which is a, about 14,000 members uh, that we represent uh, primarily through San Bernardino County, and uh, which is the largest county, one of the largest counties in the United States. And uh, we're doing a, a ton of work in the Inland Empire in Southern California, uh, obviously for worker advocacy uh, around, you know, uh, making sure that uh, workers are represented. The community understands uh, the connection with unions. Uh, the community understands the benefit of unions. Uh, you know, the, the greater community has, has, has benefited as a result of unions work for more than a hundred years. And uh, I think there's, there's been such a pretty big message, uh, anti-union message over the last 30, 40 years that most people forget that the weekends, uh, you know, healthcare, retirement issues, uh, working conditions, uh, that all those things were, you know, really brought by unions, uh, which, you know, are a group of workers that are coming together asking for a little bit more. And so we're kind of expanding on that and getting back to some basics from about 70, 80 years ago. And uh, we're having a lot of fun with it and, and engaging. Well, in California, we also got a lot of measures on the ballot because, you know, corporate interests are obviously looking to try to take control of some of these situations. And we're uh, basically having to beat all those back. Uh, even in California, everybody thinks, well, California's got this, this blue wall built around it. And, you know, it's it's got everything that we want. Uh, well, no, we've, we've got our own little wars going on uh, inside California as well, because there's a tremendous amount of money on corporate America's side. And we're doing everything we can to keep the counterbalance there for working people, for everyday working people. Uh, you know, if it wasn't for a lot of the things the unions have done the last hundred years, uh, we'd, we'd probably still be a, a, what was considered a third world nation. Um, and, you know, there'd still be, you know, the exploitation and, and a lot of the areas of workers that uh, were stomped out in the, in the 40s and 50s. Um, and so, you know, we're just trying to carry that on. Hopefully that's a pretty good introduction. It, it is, but I got to push back just a little bit, Randy. Free market. If you leave the free market alone, those, these businesses will realize that they need to take care of their employees and and do the right thing. Isn't that what you see? Sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, that's what they say. Uh, but I think every time we've allowed corporate America to run on an issue uh, or kind of 
let's let's use any regulatory factor that's been rolled back. Let's look at regulations. Right. Whenever you hear somebody say, oh, we need to roll back your regulations, there should be an equal sign after it that then says workers lose um, because, you know, regulations were usually put in play to protect somebody. I mean, corporations have killed people. Uh, look, I'm not trying to be, you know, exact. I'm not trying to exaggerate. You know, they've killed people for a few hundred years, not just 100 years, not just 200 years, um, you know, at the expense of building a railroad, at the expense of, you know, putting stuff in the ground, you know, at the expense of, of you know, making some cars, um, you know, safety factors and, and health care issues and just trying to take care of working people. Um, you know, corporations, when left to their own devices and the free market, look what they do. If you look at what they do in countries that have no regulations, they're doing what they did here in America in the 1920s. So, uh, yeah, the free market, that's what they say. I can hear the message. Uh, I've been hearing the message my entire life, but uh, most companies do not. Now, I can't say all companies, but the vast majority of them cannot help themselves. They look at uh, the opportunity to exploit people, and they just want to make more and more and more money. So oh, this is interesting to me because I just moved from Illinois, which is supposed to be a blue state. It's one of those blue border states and everything should be OK. But that was the home of the Jandis decision. That was um, the home of, of, well, you've got the Koch brothers everywhere. They're using it as a Petri dish in Illinois. And you have Democrats just kind of eh, it's OK. So what you have now in the city of Chicago is this TIF situation where we're giving corporations our tax dollars, property tax dollars, so that all externality cost is being passed on to employees and citizens. So where I live, we had a corporation come in and say, we want to expand, and we promised to make 150 jobs out of this. And my little village said, okay, we'll give you a TIF district. So I personally had paid their property taxes, but when I asked, did they create the 150 jobs? I got this slack job, wait, what do you mean? I'm like, did you not check? Because I knew that the jobs they did create, which were about 30 of them, were temporary workers. And what they were doing was hiring these people on and at the end of that contract, firing them and just churning in a new bunch. So no benefits, no protections whatsoever, but yet they were taking my taxes and I, I love how people on the right always like to use the excuse, you're stealing from our children. Well, that is an example of where our property taxes are coming as an externality cost for me. And you are literally stealing from our schools. But we allow that. Well, I, I, I'm glad you brought this up because this has been in our wheelhouse for quite some time. You know, the great American robbery has been what's gone on with local tax dollars. Uh, over the last 20 years, you know, you, they come in, they get these tax breaks, infrastructure breaks, sale tax, uh, sales tax um, incentives, uh, redirection of sales tax. And, you know, uh, the average citizen walks up to a brass, a bass pro shop, uh, buys something and then, you know, sees the sales tax line at the bottom at 8% or 9% or whatever the sales tax for that area is, thinks that that sales tax is going to the city and to the state or wherever it's supposed to go. And a lot of times half of that sales tax is actually going to the developer. It's going back to Bass Pro Shop. And what's the reason why this has happened and the reason why, whether you're a Democrat or independent or Republican, uh, because I believe whether you're a, a D, R, or I, it doesn't really matter. Most people, if they understood what's happening in their city councils, if they're understood what's happening in their local governments, they wouldn't be allowing this because what's happening is, is those developers are selling a bill of goods uh, saying, hey, we're going to create 100 jobs, 500 jobs, like the Foxconn situation in Wisconsin. Uh, one of the great American robberies was what Scott Walker did in era, uh, in Wisconsin at, at taking away uh, public sector uh, bargaining, taking away wages and benefits from public sector workers. He then took those billions of dollars and just gave them to Foxconn. And then what Foxconn promised obviously didn't deliver on it. And that has been the great American robbery over the last 20 or 30 years. At the end of the day, this is happening in every city in America. Almost every mall that goes up has got this sort of, uh, you know, sales tax diversion system has got property tax diversion. It's got 
all these incentives and breaks uh, where it's almost like we're begging uh, for these jobs to come. And what we've done, we've actually done a bunch of research in this area over the last few years, and we found uh, QVC. I'm sure everybody knows who QVC is. QVC uh, dropped down uh, in the city of Ontario uh, near us, and their deal was a the equivalent of a half a billion dollar sales tax giveaway uh, over a 20-year period. Uh, you heard that correctly, half a billion dollars. Um, like... You know, they're saying, oh, well, if we didn't do that, the city's excuse was if we didn't do that, uh, well, then they would have gone to Nevada. They'd have gone somewhere else. Well, let them go somewhere else. Like at the end of the day, would you would everybody stop undermining each other? Would everybody stop giving away the farm? Because what you're doing is you're taking out of the local resources. You're taking it out of someone else's pockets. You're having uh, the middle class or you know homeowners actually pay the taxes and you're not paying in yours. And at the end of the day. They're saying, oh, we're going to have 150 jobs, 200 jobs. There's no mechanism. There's no regulation, the big boo-boo out. Um, there's no regulation that, that holds that entity accountable when they try to promise, oh, we're going to have 100 jobs, 200 jobs, 400 jobs. And keep in mind, the fastest growing workforce in the last 10 years since the last recession uh, has been the contingent workforce, temporary, part-time, subcontractors. Like it's it's by far the largest workforce. And that's because corporate America wants it, you know, to, to take away their responsibilities, uh, drain the coffers of whatever, you know, unemployment, social security, uh, all of the things that have been put in play to have uh, pooled protectionism uh, for workers. You know, people want to call that socialism. And I always, oh, my friends or people that I know that are cops, I ask them, hey, man, hey, are you for socialism? No, no, no. Well, then you should quit. <laughs> like the That's reality exactly is, right. is, yeah. is there's, you know, there's, there's, you know, people have made certain words like they're, you know, Oh, the boogeyman's coming. But the reality it's, you know, having schools, having roads, having a, a city, having an entity that houses a place to make sure that when you turn on the faucet, the water actually comes out. Or when you flush the toilet, the stuff goes where it's supposed to go. Like those infrastructures were built and financed as a result of social programs. It's not a bad thing. Uh, but, you know, corporate America wants to divide the middle class, get people to be afraid of each other, uh, yell at each other, uh, be mad about issues that don't really impact them while they do the great American robbery and steal all of our local tax money. Oh, I, I love that you brought that up because we actually uh, published an article um, about this kind of pushback. In upstate New York, there was a company, same as in Illinois, and they're all over the place, a big pharmaceutical company who did that exact same thing. If you don't offset our taxes or you don't have a, a tax abatement for us, we're going to leave. And there was a Democratic state rep who started this entire campaign, T-shirts and everything that said, pay your damn taxes. And they went after the company and what actually happened is the, camp, the company backed down and, and backed away from their threats and is still in the area and is actually working now with the citizens <coughs> because somebody had a backbone to stand up. So let's pivot just a little bit. So now that we've set the stage, so this argument and this conversation affects everyone. Let's talk a little bit about Prop 22. So we had here, um, Andy and I had talked at length about when you have the Supreme Court argument and people are freaking out about justices and interpretations, that the antidote to that or what should precede all of that is good lawmaking. And with Prop 22, we saw that judges have ruled and we just had a, a ruling last week against corporations in favor of employees so what the corporations have done is try to get a new law passed through a ballot initiative. Um, would you say that that's correct? Yeah, they're trying to get a carve out. That's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to get an exception to the rule for just them. So explain explain for people who don't really know what, what they're trying to do with Prop 22. We know that the differentiation in employment law between a contractor and an employee has something to do with a measure of guidance and, and what autonomy that person has. Like if I'm an expert right. consultant and I can just come in and do my job, I'm not necessarily an employee. So 
explain this for people who maybe don't get the nuance. So interestingly enough, I was one of the individuals almost 30 years ago that worked on an organizing campaign that kind of broke the ground on this with uh, a different employers, uh, which is uh, deeming them to be independent contractors for the purposes of collective bargaining so that they can organize. And the, there's some tests in there uh, that are very simple in a, in a way of explaining it. Um, so let's use Amazon as an example right now, uh, because everybody sees these Amazon vans coming out of nowhere, right? They're all over the place. Uh, most of those people driving Amazon vans don't work for Amazon. They actually work for a contractor, a DSP. And, and the reason I use Amazon is because everybody knows what Amazon is. Heck, probably everybody gets a package delivered by them, right? So you look at that company and you think, oh, okay, well, those are Amazon drivers. Technically, they're not Amazon drivers. So Amazon's not responsible for what's going on there. And the tests are, you know, how much control does the ultimately the brand have over the delivery or the conditions of work that that employee is being employed in? You know, shirt. Uh, what the van looks like, when they report to work, when they leave, um, you know, uh, how they take their breaks and lunches, where the supervision comes from. And when a single employer, in this case, like Amazon uh, or Uber, Lyft, in the, in the conditions of Prop 22, have complete, almost complete control over how you're managing your day-to-day -day operation and you're spending almost uh, all of, if not all of your time, and most of the time it's 100% of your time uh, working for that single employer, you're an employee, you're not a subcontractor. And so let's, let's go back in history. Uh, you know, drivers, uh, you know, the good thing about the Teamsters is, you know, we have been on this journey with drivers for more than 100 years. We, we were, uh, you know, we've represented drivers since there were reins in the driver's hands and there were horses in front of them when they were moving buggies. It's still in our logo. Uh, and we're proud of that history because we have, we have transcended all of those technological changes over the last hundred years. We have been that advocate for drivers. We have been that advocate for cab drivers, for, 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 for couriers, for delivery drivers. We have been right there side by side, you know, helping create the Department of Transportation, helping create all these rules and regulations to prevent somebody from having to drive 100 hours a week, die, you know, falling asleep while, while a big rig is driving down the road and killing an entire family, which is which is what we which is what we've gone through and ironically which is what we're spinning back towards and so uh you know 70 80 years ago uh almost every driver or every employee in that industry was an independent contractor and everybody it was very low paid the working conditions were extremely difficult um and people could not make ends meet so you know clearly after us organizing the industry and then helping regulate the industry uh, we were able to improve the industry over a long period of time. So Prop 22 and issues in this industry are very near and dear to us uh, because obviously we have we have been on this journey with these workers for more than 100 years. And so Prop 22 is a car. They're trying to create a carve out uh, law. Uh, so here the, you got the law of the land under the National Labor Relations Board, which is a federal law. And then at the state level, um, you know, the state of California, we pressed the state of California uh, to get a little bit more assertive on uh, making sure that independent contractors and the abuse of that status doesn't continue to accelerate. So AB5 was passed. Once AB5 was passed a, a couple years ago, that's where Prop 22's come about. Uber and Lyft have now spent over $200 million to get a carve out on the law, an exception in the law. So the reason why everybody should pay attention to this across the country, regardless if you live in California or not, is if they pull this off and are able to get a carve out on the law, every industry is going to be subject to this by a few wealthy people. Uh, you know, you brought up the Koch brothers earlier. Uh, you brought up some of these super wealthy individuals. I mean, how quick is it, how easy it is for, is it for them to, to dump a few hundred million dollars and, you know, go state by state and start rolling out these propositions uh, that create carve outs in almost every single industry. And then guess what we're stuck with? Now we're stuck with everybody being independent contractors. And the problem with that is comes with, you know, no one's paying their unemployment. No one's paying, uh, it, you know, their, their benefits obviously have to be self-sustained. They're workman's comp. You know, 
getting hurt on the job, um, you know, social security, you know, all of the basic security provisions in which workers have kind of come accustomed to in California, or excuse me, in the United States uh, are being, there's a shiny little object in front of them. Oh, you could be your own boss. So let me use a, another statistic that compares the situation. In the last 30 years, workers having a defined pension. And when I jumped on this call, I heard you talking about pensions, which is a really important subject because when you look at the statistics, the factual statistics of this, it's scary as hell. 50 years ago, almost 80% of workers had a defined benefit provided by their employer. They had a pension. Today, uh, that number, you fast forward to 2020, that number is somewhere around 12%, only 13%. And so more than 80% of workers have to depend on a 401k type of system for their retirement. And so obviously people that are impacted by the Prop 22 campaign are, or, or by that initiative are just as affected by these statistics. And this is why this statistic is so important is out of the 80% of people that have a 401k as their primary source of retirement. Now, the original drafters of the 401k language came out two years ago and are, they openly said they were disgusted by its use of how the 401k has now become the primary retirement vehicle. They actually said the reason why they built it was a supplemental to retirement, not the primary retirement vehicle. Once again, the free market has created a situation where this is now the rule. So now look at the statistics of how people retire under a 401k system. Out of the 80% of people that are working that qualify to participate in a 401k, if we assume that they all participate in it, which they don't, but let's assume for statistical reasons that they all participate in the 401k, more than 80% of those have to draw it down to zero, zero before they retire because of a death in the family or because of a death, because of a healthcare issue or a plant shutdown or a loss of job. So more than 80% of them. So when you take that, you carve all those numbers out, you have essentially less than 20% of the population with a retirement vehicle. And so now when you push everybody under a subcontractor, independent contractor system, like what's in Prop 22, you start stacking these situations on top of each other. What are people going to do when they when they punch the golden ticket, you know, uh, at the time of retirement? What's going to happen? Well, well wait a second. Let, let's not forget that a 401k is still a casino bet, right? I mean, I saw my own 401k lose 60 percent of its value in 2007, 2008. And the market is so volatile right now and continuing that I cannot plan for retirement on a 401k. But I want to shift just a little bit into the counter argument that Uber and Lyft and Instacart and all of these contract kind of scenario companies are making in favor of Prop 22. So you, you touched on it a little bit, you can be your own boss. And even some of the drivers are saying, like my autonomy. Well, autonomy itself does not necessarily go away under worker protections. It is kind of one of the lies that we see coming out of the argument for Prop 22. So Andy, um, I, I forwarded you some tweets from Vanessa Bain, and she's an Instacart shopper, and she brought up some highlights here, some of the discrepancy and what the company is actually doing against workers who are not in favor of Prop 22 and how they are using their ability to forward Prop 22 to California voters. So in the first uh, tweet, Vanessa talks about how it's requiring shoppers who are uncompensated for their work to distribute Prop 22 propaganda to customers against our own self-interest. And she says, even if, a big if, this is legal, it is reprehensible in an established dangerous precedent for workers. So then uh, she goes on to talk about how the company itself told them that when they did flyering, a flyering campaign aimed at customers between Surrey and TIP, trying to explain that, teaching them about how their pay has changed under Instacart's policy, the company prohibited them from doing those flyers under safety, a safety guideline. Yet now they're requiring that same flyering by drivers in favor of Prop 22. So we see this whole discrepancy 
And um, I'm not sure about the law in California when it comes to electioneering and things like this, but can they use their own drivers who may not support Prop 22 to forward propaganda and literature for Prop 22? Hey, hey, we live in we live in the United States of America that you know you got freedom of speech until you go to work. <laughs> reality is, the reality is, is what people don't realize is that that could be the law, but it doesn't matter what the law is. These corporations and these businesses are going to argue both sides uh, to, to their benefit, and they always have, and they always will. Uh, it is not going to change anytime soon, um, especially when you have that much money and that much influence. It is, uh, in some ways, it is a violation of law. It's a gray area. At the end of the day, they don't care. Um, they're going to they're at they're going to try to win this. At uh, I'm an Instacart customer, and so I've been subject to exactly what you're referring to. And so, at the end of the day. Um, you know, what we got to do is as working people, as everyday middle class people, is we got to just have that conversation and we got to explain to that worker, hey, this is what's going on. Because, of course, you have a bunch of people that work for, um, you know, Uber and Lyft and Instacart and all these uh, institutions where they're saying, oh, hey, I'm good with it. Of course, they're going to say that. That's that's currently who's cutting their check, number one. And number two, if they don't understand the rules of the system and what could be negotiated under collective bargaining agreement or what the potential is, that's all that they know. So at the end of the day, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm good with this for right now. Uh, most of those jobs and, and quite frankly, most of the commercials we see where uh, they say they have um, – these drivers supporting it, they're actually actors. We're the ones that have been getting the real drivers out and actually talking about uh, Prop 22 and why they're not supportive of it. And so at the end of the day, it's just employer suppression. Uh, it, you know, it's been going on for, you know, since the beginning of time. Uh, of course, most people are going to be like, well, my employer says to go left, I'm going to go left. Uh, because we're brought up in school to be, you know, obedient and and don't rock the boat and kind of work with everybody. Uh, and you're not allowed to revolt. <laughs> yeah, fall in line, fall in line. So uh, real quick, this is a great question to kind of wrap things up with Jeffrey, who is watching. Hi, Jeffrey. Good morning. He says, um, Jeffrey's out of Indiana. And he said, local movers here used to be a part of the uh, Teamsters Union but they have all been snubbed out. And we've seen that time and time again with union workers. He, and he wants me to ask you about getting established again with the Teamsters in his state and in other states. How do people get involved with the Teamsters and, and join your union? The first thing they, they need to do is, is obviously uh, there's some, depends on some issues with the, with the work group. Um, but the first thing I gotta do is pick up the phone, call the local union. Um, I know for us, you can just go to teamsterslocal1932.org uh, and we will connect you to your local union in your area. Or you can go to teamsters.org uh, and they will do the same thing. Um, but, you know, it's pick up the phone, give the local union a call and organize your place of employment. Uh, that is, you know, an interesting point. I think it was Jeffrey that brought it up. Uh, you, you said is most workers are not aware in today's day that you can unionize and you can organize. And if you look at what's going on in today's climate and you see you know, millions of people kind of saying, hey, there's a bit of an imbalance here right now. Um, if you look back at collective bargaining from 1935 to 1965, the gap of inequality for color, for women, for any uh, sort of uh, exploitation was closed more between 1935 and 1965 than it has between 65 and today. And the reason why that happened is because unionization was almost 40% in 1965. And as a result of almost half the population having a collective bargaining agreement, it created a balance. It created a balance across industries to prevent exploitation, to prevent someone from saying, you know, Carrie, you're a woman, I'm going to pay you less. You know what, Johnny, you're black, I'm going to pay you less. Uh, the Teamsters Union was one of the first unions, if not the first union, to have colorblind contracts and to have genderblind contracts and to take a position in the early 1900s, 1911, 1917. Hey, we're going to welcome everybody into our organization and everybody's going to be paid equally because everybody's working the same place and there's no reason to be paying people different. So what 
the individual can do is pick up the phone, find a Teamster uh, local in their area, uh, look to start to organize them, uh, get a couple of your workers together and, and identify if you have some common interest and figure out what you need to have in a collective bargaining agreement. Because, you know, what's wrong with having your employer? It's not that you hate your employer. You want to just make sure you have a guarantee. Your employer has contracts with their customers with whom they're doing business with. Why don't you have a contract with your employer? Because you have an, uh, you, you have something you're giving them, which is your work and your labor every day. So have a contract with your employer to make sure that those terms and conditions are fair and balanced over the term uh, of the next year, two years, three years, or four years. Uh, so hopefully that answers the question. That's what he can do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So on Prop 22, it's a vote no? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely no on 22. It, it, if, it, if a yes passes, we're going to see that you know rip through the United States. Uh, and you're going to see uh, carve outs all over the place. And that's a very dangerous place to be to give that much power to corporate America. Perfect. A excellent. And Andy, once again, I've dominated the conversation. Um, do you have any final thoughts for our lovely guest here? No, I, I you know, just drawn my own experiences. And, and you know, I think that uh, being a Canadian, that, you um, their society has allowed unions to be somewhat stronger and being able to keep a lot of the of the of the union initiatives that were gained over through North America over the years, right? It's been um, uh, initiatives like the right to work in certain states and the uh, demonization of unions over the last period of time that has has. Uh, by capital that has has made life just horrible. It's, that, that you know the powers that be and the local politicians and the billionaire class have been able to to demonize unions to the point where the only friend that workers have in society is unions, and you're not allowed to trust them. You're not supposed to trust them anymore because they don't have your you know your your uh, you're back in in the situation when really they are your only especially now in in the unfettered capitalist society that is the united states and i just find that appalling right there's one one um thing that i wanted to mention is that uh pavlina Chernova, uh in a conversation with her just recently in the state of New York, I think it was some somewhere in the neighborhood of four point five billion dollars in tax breaks was promised to Amazon so they could set up a major warehouse warehouse in that state, and that money could have paid for a jobs guarantee program for all unemployed um, New Yorkers in that state for a year, right? that's the kind of en enemy that we're dealing with, right? We, when we look towards capital to and capitalism to cure everything with a market, mm -hmm. it's not, a, it can't do that. It's a capitalist, uh, the, the, the private sector is profit driven. They're not worried about the workers, right? That's where unions have to take up that gap. And we need to work towards strengthening our unions and expanding them to where they were, or else mm -hmm. the, it's not going to, it's just not going to um, end well. <laughs> no, no, it's not. And and 40% is not a lot of the workforce. And look at the sweeping <coughs> improvements we were able to make with our parents' generation and prior. So it's, it behooves everyone to at least consider um, the the field that you're in. There's a union that represents you in, in whatever work you're doing, whatever industry you're in, go and see about it. And the thing I love about unions that, that I hate about politics is it's a hell of a lot easier to run for office as a senior representative in your union than it is to run for Congress, right? So when people complain about, well, I don't like my union, run for office, run for representative, get involved. And it's so much easier in a union, which is the core of a, a democracy, an example of a democratic organization. Do that, improve it, change it. And it is far easier to do than 
changing, you know, my, my previous congressman who is not leaning left, even though he's wearing a blue jumpsuit. So, so it, it, yeah, that's a whole nother conversation. So Randy, thank you so much for joining us, for getting up early with us and, and your colleagues in DC and really taking the time to explain this and why people should care about what's happening in California across the country and why the Teamsters are out in front of all of this. So thank you. You're welcome. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Perfect. So any, any, any final thoughts? No, I'm yeah. good. I, I, I really, you know, uh, I think this is this is such an important thing that that uh, and and we, you and I discussed this that California, what happens in in California on this will sweep across the country, right? And there's the unions have been defanged so much in the last little while that we at least have to hold on to what we have now, or Things are just going to, especially <laughs> during a pandemic when people's health care tied to their jobs, right? That's huge. Yeah, absolutely. Can I can I say something? Can I sure, sure. Yeah, you know, Andy, you pointed out something regarding, you know, uh, this, how unions have been perceived recently. Uh, real, and the reality is, is, you know, unions have been demonized and somehow we're the villain. Uh, the amazing thing is, is what I love so much about uh, my job and what I've been doing for the time that I've been fortunate enough to do it is that we're work, walking side by side with working people every single day. And we're helping individuals, you know, gain good health care, retirement health care, uh, retirement vehicles, working conditions, raises, uh, changing, you know, their work environment in a positive way with their input. And a lot of times making their employer more productive as a result of those conversations. And the, the statistics have shown that union workers are far more productive than non-union workers for all the things in which I just listed. And so for the last more than 100 years, we've been on this journey with working people. And unions aren't these institutions uh, that, 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 that the corporations want to villainize. They're everyday working people. They coach baseball. They're the nurses. They're the police officers. They're the, you know, they're the person that, that answers the dispatch when they dial 911. The person that's there to help you. They deliver food to your children's school. Um, you know, union workers are part of our community, part of our everyday environment. And for some reason, we've all been villainized for corporate profit. And so we just got to wake everybody up and say, hey, let's just get to the basics and, and kind of work together that, that we can make America great by working together and helping one another. That's how it works. Absolutely. Beautifully said, beautifully said. And so for everyone who's watching, thank you for those who uh, weighed in with your comments. All the comments are just like, like right only in agreement with you. So we love to see that. So you can do something a little bit more share this broadcast with your friends and family, particularly those who are in California who are weighing their options on Prop 22, convince them that voting no is the way to go. And then for everyone else, seriously consider looking at a union for membership. If not membership, then support them because they support all workers across our country. And this is where we talk about all of us or none. They divide us, guess what's gonna happen? We're on our own. So. Um, that's it for us here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Andy, any closing thoughts? Just wanted to uh, emphasize that look at a couple of years ago, what the teachers were able to accomplish on their own. How they stood up to the state and the, the governors and their, their states and the representatives, and they actually got real gains for themselves. That's what a union does. That's, that's what the strength of people getting together for a common cause because ultimately, what do we have as workers? We got the numbers. Beautifully said, beautifully said. So um, thank you everyone for tuning in this important, important broadcast. And we will be back, back here on Friday live, bright and early, same time. And we will get to all of your comments and questions. If you have a topic that you want us to cover, something you're not real familiar with, 
want to know more about or you think is really important for everyone else to hear, drop us a line, send us a message on Facebook, on Twitter. We're on Twitch. Um, we're on Daily Mail. We have a website. We have email. All of these channels are available to you. So thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you on Friday. We about that, ay, bringing the song, we out here, yeah, speeding the facts, how we're supposed to be, heritage dog, we keep it in G, whoa.